Thank you and good morning, everyone. My name is Jake Zaskin. I'll be your facilitator this morning, as well as moderating our chat panel for any questions you might have during the webinar. I'm joined by my colleague, Joe Goodwin, who will be walking us through our material. We're excited to be here today to present an introduction to incident analysis. Let's get started. Today we'll be uh, providing an overview of cybersecurity general awareness. We'll be discussing uh, indicators of compromise on the network as they pertain to incident analysis. We'll be defining incident analysis, discussing the importance and provide context around incident analysis, review the processes around incident analysis. We'll uh, look at a quick tool demo um, to, to show you some of the available tools. We'll then wrap up with a short knowledge check and some key takeaways. Finally, we'll share resources that enable you and your organization to learn more about incident analysis. So from a learning objective standpoint, our terminal objective today is to understand the core aspects of incident analysis and its importance to cybersecurity and incident response. To achieve that terminal objective, a few of the enabling objectives will be defining what incident analysis is, why it's important, explain how incident analysis supports incident response, and then introduce some resources and tools that help organizations and individuals use incident analysis to identify threat activity and inform incident response. So as a baseline to cyber awareness, it's critical to understand organizational readiness. You can't effectively respond to something if you don't know the status of your environment and you don't have a plan. Digital infrastructure is inherently interdependent and complex. Incident responders use numerous methods to identify a threat or a potential compromise. Sometimes there are clear signs that something may be awry, such as a phishing email, access issues, unusual network performance like slowed systems or corrupted files, and unusual activity such as unexplained file or folder changes or configuration changes. These activities are easier to identify because they are known methods or symptoms of an attack. And there is often awareness training and general knowledge around these common indicators. However, most cyber threat activity does not result in these obvious impacts. Cyber threat actors do not want to be detected. They want access, they want access to system to perform reconnaissance and execute their objectives without being discovered. So the goal of cybersecurity is to create a layered network defense and reduce those open vulnerabilities to keep out the unauthorized users and activity. So if we know that threat actors could already be in a given system, how can incident responders identify a potential intrusion to find the threat actors are in the system and then do the investigation, the analysis to figure out what they are doing or what they did? Sophisticated threat actors likely will not leave obvious clues behind. We know that incident responders can collect and use indicators of compromise to analyze potential threat activity. Network defenders and incident responders must set up logging and tracking for their systems to effectively identify unusual activity, to triage issues, and to filter out non-incidents. So we'll do a quick review of, of indicators of compromise or IOCs. So these are what you use for incident analysis. It's a clue or a forensic artifact that can be used to indicate an intrusion or a compromise of a host in a network. So in other words, these are clues that something went wrong and it needs to be investigated. IOCs can reveal things like the TTPs or the tactics, techniques, and procedures used the severity of the compromise, where a mitigation should be applied, and even which adversary or who the threat actors are in attempting the compromise. So if we look at incidents in general, uh, look at some definitions here. According to NIST, incident is an occurrence that actually or potentially jeopardizes the confidentiality, the integrity, or availability of an information system or the information the system processes, stores, or transmits, or that constitutes a violation or imminent threat of violation 
of security policies, procedures, or acceptable use policies. Furthermore, according to this incident analysis, is the examination of acquired data for its uh, significance or probative value to the case. A data breach is the unauthorized movement or disclosure of sensitive information to a party, usually outside the organiza organization, that is not authorized to have or see the information. Now, a disclosure of information is data divulged without authorization. A bit of a, a, a difference there in the clarifications between data breach and disclosure that's important to notify. A couple other things to, to point out. From a, from a definition standpoint, if we look at uh, CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, confidentiality is preserving the authorized restrictions on information access and disclosure. This um, includes means for protecting personal privacy and proprietary information. With respect to the integrity of information, this is guarding against improper information modification or destruction and includes ensuring information non-repudiation and authenticity. And then the availability of information is ensuring that timely and reliable access to and the use of information. So again, the confidentiality is protecting it so those who aren't authorized can't see it. Integrity is ensuring it's not changed or modified. And the availability is ensuring that for those who need it, they can access it. Great. So let's throw a question out to the audience. Uh, who has hands-on experience with incident analysis? So we will bring up a polling pod. So just go ahead and click on a response, whether you have or have not. Uh, just to get a, again, take the temperature of the audience to see who has done some incident analysis from a hands-on perspective. Let provide some time to let answers roll in. Looks like the majority of folks have some experience with incident analysis, which is great. All right, looks like we're leveling out a little bit. About 60-40 split, roughly speaking, in terms of those who have versus those who have not. Okay, great. We'll close out that poll and move forward. So spend a brief amount of time differentiating uh, an event from an incident. So generally speaking, events occur constantly, as opposed to an incident, which is a suspicious event with unwanted activity. So if we look at the table here, just a nice way to kind of summarize events and incidents with respect to various components. If we look at access, an event which would be authorized, our users logging into systems with author authorized passwords. We do that every day. Again, events occurring constantly. An incident with respect to access might be that agent gaining unauthorized access internal to the network with compromised permissions, stolen passwords or um, things like that. From a disclosure standpoint, standard activity is users sharing internal information with other authorized member of an organization, sharing files, emails, information in that, perfectly on the up and up. Unauthorized, an incident might be granting privileges to individuals that do not require a high level of access or escalating privileges without that authorization, or the unauthorized disclosure of information and sharing of files. Collection. A collection event might be a, a team conducts a vulnerability scan to measure their organization's security posture. But an incident might be an external agent collecting information of the internal infrastructure from the outside, gaining intel on, on how they're organized and what those vulnerabilities might be. And then last but not least, disposal. So authorized events, administrative teams remove logs after older logs uh, have been collected and, and archived. But from an incident standpoint, perhaps logs are deleted without consent. So again, just a summary of, sign of some, some common activities that could either be authorized events or unauthorized incidents that require further investigation.
So let's look at importance and context of incident analysis. Setting up effective incident analysis improves an organization's cybersecurity posture overall. As the tools and methods involved provide situational awareness of the networks and systems. Again, it's important to understand your network, to return to normal operations, and then uh, pick up on those lessons learned and improve defenses. Understanding your assets, including your high-value assets, notably, and how information communication is handled and tracked is crucial to maintaining a defensive posture without shutting yourself into a, a vault. So let, let's take, for example, a, a metropolitan city, say the size of Washington, D.C. Cities have borders, either artificial man-made borders or natural borders like mountains and rivers. So for this city, you have a multitude of highways, side roads, and routes within city limits, but also multiple entry points from outside the city limits. On these roads are many different types of vehicles, but for this analogy, we're going to focus on personal vehicles, like your, uh, your sedans, and, and then tracked vehicles. These are, for example, tractor trailers with Department of Transportation certifications. Personal vehicles are for personal vehicles, the only really identification that a vehicle is traversing your city is if you get pulled over and law enforcement looks up your records based on your driver's license and registration, for example. But for the tractor trailer, there's a shipment manifest along with the driver's information and the vehicle registration. So the key difference besides the size of the payload that the sedan versus the tractor trailer is carrying is that the tractor trailer has a shipment manifest that details the contents of the vehicle, where the shipment originated, and where it is going. So who cares? Why does this matter? Well, let's say that your city is a network. You've locked down entry into your city to a couple of roads, and you want to monitor what goes in and out of your city via these, these routes. For tractor trailers, you know from external markings what the tractor trailer should contain, because you can look it up easily. For the personal vehicles, they would need to be searched one by one at the perimeter of your city in order to know what's in them. Network traffic uh, commutes to, through, and with your network appliances via data packets, kind of in a similar way. These data packets are handled by different communication protocols. The protocols govern your ability to monitor the contents of those packets as they traverse your network. Transmission control protocol. Internet Protocol, TCIP, and User Datagram Protocol, UDP. TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, whereas UDP is a connectionless protocol. A key difference between TCP and UDP is speed, as TCP is comparatively, comparatively slower than UDP. Overall, UDP is a much faster, simpler, and efficient protocol. However, retransmission of lost data packets is only possible with TCP. So back to our analogy, your tractor trailers, where you um, know contents, origination, and destination are your data packets traversing using TCP, whereas your personal vehicles are your data packets traversing using UDP. So the key takeaway is for incident analysis, you're going to be monitoring your network traffic using a myriad of IT and network tools and applications. But what it comes down to is your ability to analyze the data packets that have traversed your network because in those packets may be pieces of malicious code that allow an adversary the ability to act within your network. You have limited resources. You can't search every single UDP packet, but you'll need to balance setting up that roadblock and searching everyone and limiting your search criteria to what may be indications of nefarious traffic. So let's review uh, steps of of incident analysis. We'll look at uh, briefly prepare, identify, containing, eradicating, recovering, and then lessons learned. So step one, prepare. Incident analysis begins with that preparation activity to identify an incident from events occurring in your environment. So this phase may include the acquisition of tools needed to conduct the analysis, training on the use of those tools, and training of incident analysis methodology. 
kind of like this training as a, as a high-level intro to incident analysis. And generally speaking, what are some of those tools that may be available? It's also important to note in the preparation phase is, as we talked about in one of the, the earlier slides, is understanding uh, your overall uh, enterprise ecosystem, knowing what's on the network, what may be anomalous, and kind of setting the, setting the stage from that standpoint in order to be fully prepared. Then it's identification. So when suspicious events occur in the environment, they'll be investigated to determine if they are an incident or a false positive. Again, going back to the table we looked at, that, that, that balance between uh, events, which occur constantly, versus incidents, which are those anomalous events that require the investigation of unauthorized activity. If an agency or report is sent to an analyst, these can be events already identified as incidents that require further analysis. If so, then we can move on to the next step. So in containment, we just want to prevent that further compromise of assets in our organization. We want to isolate that incident into a sandboxed environment, into that environment where a deep dive can be done over time without letting it propagate through the system, um, thereby hence containing the incident. And then we move on to eradication. The systems that have been contained in the previous step will undergo the process of eradicating any of that malware or the viruses, or in some cases, wiping the system clean. Again, done in that, in that quote, sandboxed environment. So the rest of the system can function properly as needed from a continuity of operation standpoint, but that isolated contained system uh, can be worked on. And then recovery. So the systems that have been eradicated of the compromise may need to have their operating system re-imaged re or rebuilt or replaced. That's part of the recovery process. The systems will be tested in a pre-deployment environment prior to returning them to the network to ensure, again, a, a seamless reintroduction. The recovery phase is complete once the system is back in operation in the environment and operations are continuing as normal. And then last but not least, certainly are the lessons learned. This is the final phase of an incident analysis, and it's documenting the findings and mitigating the procedures used to return to normal operations. This phase helps organizations prevent future similar events and provides learning methodology to prepare the analyst in case there are uh, another similar occurrence, and thus starts the cycle over again and prepare. Now, it, it, it's very important to say this isn't just within the organization. We can't emphasize enough how, it, how important it is to share these lessons learned with um, not only other sub-organizations within, within your group, your company, your agency, but outside as well. Uh, again, from a, a cybersecurity battlefield standpoint, we're all in this together. So as, as, uh, as there are attacks that occur, incidents that occur, it only benefits everybody and raises the level of everybody's preparedness if we share those lessons learned in the best way possible, understanding, sure, there are some confidentiality issues and things like that, but we definitely want to be able to, um, to share those lessons learned outside of the organizations. Absolutely. Thanks, Joe. Uh, can you take us through some real-world cybersecurity incidents? Sure, absolutely. So we'll just, I'll kind of talk briefly through two incidents before we get to our, our tool demo. Again, just to kind of provide some context on, on some things that may happen. So first we'll look at the OPM hack. So in June of 2015, OPM discovered that the background investigation records of current, former, and some prospective federal employees and contractors had been stolen. OPM and the interagency incident response team had concluded that sensitive information, including social security numbers of over 21 million people, was stolen from the background investigation databases. 
This includes over 19 million individuals that applied for a background investigation, and then uh, over 1.8 million non-applicants who were primarily spouses or cohabitants of applicants. So those are the folks that, for those of you on, on the uh, webinar today who've done background investigations, you have to list out uh, relatives and acquaintances and things like that. So that's what they're talking about there. So officials said that the thieves broke in by using stolen contractor logins and passwords. Attackers had gained valid user credentials to the system they were attacking, likely then through social engineering. The breach also consisted of a malware package which installed itself within OPM's network and established a backdoor. So we're starting to see things that will be picked up by analysts as they're looking for red flags, whether actively or retroactively. So we've got stolen credentials, malware. The first breach, which was named Quote X1 by DHS, was discovered March 20th of 2014 when a third party notified DHS of data exfiltration from OPM's network. Then a second breach, named X2, uh, with respect to that breach, the New York Times had reported that the infiltration was discovered using uh, the U.S. Computer Emergency Readiness Team's Einstein Intrusion Detection Program. Now, however, the Wall Street Journal uh, Wired and Fortune later reported that it was unclear how the breach was discovered. They reported that it may have been a product of uh, a product demonstration of a certain commercial forensic product out of Manassas. The reports were subsequently discussed in a press release issued by the company on, on uh, June 15th of 2015 to clarify contradictions made by OPM spokesman in a later edit of the Fortune article. However, it was not uh, the services company that uncovered the infiltration. Rather, it was detected by OPM personnel using a software product of a certain software uh, cybersecurity vendor. Ultimately, the conclusive House of Representatives Majority Staff Report on the OPM breach discovered no evidence suggesting that uh, uh, the separate vendor's services knew of involvement or had prior knowledge of an existing breach at the time of its product demonstration, leading to the finding that both, both of the tools independently, quote, discovered the malicious code running on the network. So on the morning of April 15th in 2015, there was a security engineer who set out to decrypt a portion of the SSL traffic that flows across the agency's digital network. Here we are back to our, our city traffic analogy. Hackers uh, had become adept at using SSL encryption to cloak their exploits much as online vendors use it to shield credit card numbers in, in transit. The analyst noticed that his uh, decryption efforts had exposed an odd bit of outbound traffic incident, a beacon-like signal pinging to a site called opmsecurity.org. But OPM didn't own a domain named opm-security.org. The OPM-related name suggested it had been created to deceive. When he and his colleagues used a security program to dig a little deeper, they located the signal source. It was a, a file called uh, mcutil.dll, which is a standard component of software sold by one of the large security giants. But that didn't make any sense because OPM doesn't use that company's products. He and the other engineers soon realized that this file was hiding a piece of malware designed to give a hacker access to the agency servers. So. Once the U.S. SIR team's first, one of their first moves was to analyze the malware that had been found attached to this DLL file. The program turned out to be one they knew very well. It was a variant of PlugX, a remote access tool deployed commonly by the Chinese. The tool has also shown up on computers used by foes of China's government, including activists in Hong Kong and Tibet. The malware's code is always slightly tweaked between attacks, so firewalls can't recognize it. So a technician from the security software company who was supporting the effort spotted uh, another encrypted RAR file that the attackers had neglected to, uh, to delete. He knew that files of this type are used to store compressed data and are often employed by hackers to shrink files for efficient exfiltration. The scans had identified over 2,000 pieces of malware that were unrelated to the attack in question. And this was everything from routine adware to dormant viruses. 
the plug X variant that they were seeking to annihilate was present on fewer than 10 OPM machines. Unfortunately, some of those machines were pivotal to the entire network. One of those machines was an administrative server called Jumpbox that's used to log in to all the other servers, uh, compromised servers. By controlling that server, the attackers had gained access to every nook and cranny of OPM's digital terrain. The investigators wondered whether uh, that the APT had pulled off that impressive feat with the aid of system blueprints stolen in the breach that was discovered in March X1. If that were the case, then the hackers had devoted months to laying the groundwork for this attack. As an FYI to this, the attackers here had a, a sense of humor. Uh, the domain name and others like it were registered to, quote, Steve Rogers and Tony Stark, otherwise known as Marvel's Captain America and Iron Man. Now, the, the key here is really anonymity and attribution. So depending on the scope of the attack and intended socioeconomic impacts, these groups are sophisticated where naming C2 domains after Marvel characters are to either poke fun at the target or simply to provide uh, a distraction. But the bottom line is that this type of behavior is seen across all threat actors, from script kiddies to independent organizations and even state-sponsored groups. So now we'll look at um, the Operation Ghost Click. So in this case, there were six Estonian nationals and one Russian national who were charged in engaging a massive and sophisticated Internet fraud screen that used malware to infect more than 4 million computers located in over 100 countries. Of the computers infected with the malware, at least a half a million were in the U.S., including computers belonging to the U.S. government, uh, educational institutions, nonprofits, commercial businesses, and individuals. The malware recently, or the malware secretly altered the settings of infected computers, enabling the defendants to digitally hijack internet searches and then reroute computers to certain websites and advertisements, which entitled the defendants to be paid. The defendants subsequently received fees each time these websites or these ads were clicked on or were viewed by the users. The malware also prevented the installation of antivirus software and operating system updates on infected computers, which essentially left those computers and their users unable to detect or stop the malware, and it then exposed them to attacks by other viruses. The, some of these details uh, that we're about to share in this webinar come from the U.S. Attorney's Office press release regarding that, the operation Ghost click. So as alleged in the indictment, uh, the defendants controlled and operated various companies that masqueraded as legitimate publisher networks in the Internet advertising industry. So these networks entered into agreements with ad brokers under which they were paid on the number of times that the Internet users clicked on links for certain websites or advertisements or based on the number of times that certain advertisements were displayed on certain websites. So the more traffic to the advertisers' websites and display ads, the more money the defendants earned under their agreements. So as alleged in the indictment, the defendants fraudulently increased the traffic to the websites and, the adverti uh, and, and, uh, and advertisements that would earn them money. They accomplished this by making it appear to advertisers that the Internet traffic came from legitimate clicks and ad displays on the defendant's publisher networks, when in actuality it had not. So the way they did this was to carry it out, they, they used what was known as a rogue DNS server, uh, or, or rogue DNS and, and malware that was designed to alter the DNS server settings on the infected computers. The victim's computers became infected with malware when they visited certain websites or downloaded certain software to view videos online. The malware altered the DNS settings on victims' computers to route the infected computers to the rogue DNS servers controlled and operated by the defendants and their co-conspirators. The rerouting took two forms that are um, uh, described as click hijacking and advertising replacement fraud. The malware also prevented the infected computers from receiving antivirus software updates or operating system updates that otherwise might have detected the malware and stopped it. In addition, the infected computers were also left vulnerable 
by other viruses. So before we dive into our tool demo, um, just a couple definitions and, um, on, and setting you up for the tool demo. So security information and event management is a term that you hear. This is an application that provides the ability uh, to gather security data from information system components and present that data as actionable information via a single interface. A network analyzer is a service uh, tool or human that measures network parameters. Packet capture analysis or PCAP. This is a, a, a packet, so a packet is a block of data transmitted across the network. We refer to that in the traffic analogy. Uses a, um, PCAP uses a packet analyzer for network traffic monitoring, for network traffic monitoring and deep packet inspection for troubleshooting of network performance issues and network application issues. Wireshark, which you'll hear about, is a free and open source packet analyzer. It is used for network troubleshooting, analysis, software and communications protocol development, and education. And then you'll hear about Security Onion. This is uh, another free and open source Linux distribution for intrusion detection, security monitoring, and log management. It can be deployed as a SIEM solution um, that can also be integrated with an intrusion detection system. So with that, we have a, a brief, about a seven, eight minute uh, tool demo, and then we'll go ahead with the conclusion of the webinar. Hello, my name is Ricardo Davidson, Sr. I have 21 years in information technology with seven years cybersecurity, having worked in the stock for four years with a specialization in digital forensics and incident response. I will conduct a high-level demonstration of tool usage in performing syslog analysis. We've covered different security information and event management, or SIM, tools throughout this presentation. I will cover a SIM solution as well as another tool, Wireshark, that analysts can use for analyzing network traffic. First, I want to reiterate the importance of performing syslog analysis, conversely called network forensics. Cybersecurity logs provide a wealth of information that allows an analyst to identify IP addresses, affected hosts, and connections that were maintained when an anomaly occurred that sparked the alert. An anomaly consists of anything that's outside normal network traffic activity. This could be adding a user outside of designated hours or suspicious traffic connections to a host within your environment. So with that being stated, let's log into our Windows 10 virtual machine where I have access to SIM solution and Wireshark. Then we'll use Chrome to log into security on it, which is our SIM solution. Okay, I've logged into a Windows 10 where I have the necessary tools already installed. Launching Chrome, I can now log into our SIM solution. Now we've logged into Security Onion, our SIM solution. And as you can see, you have an overview tab, but if you hit these pancakes, you have, you'll see the other uh, functionality that you have in this same solution. You, you see an overview, alerts, hunt, PCAP, etc. for monitoring purposes. Most SIMs will have this functionality. I'll operate from the scenario that alerts were generated indicating suspicious behavior is occurring in the enterprise. So I'll scroll to the alerts tab and you can you can receive an alert via email or if you're monitoring your scene. So you can just scroll to your alerts tab here. And you see the following alerts occur. All right, these are these particular alerts were generated over a two-week period, but you can scale them from weeks 
to seconds, to minutes, to hours, days, etc., all the way to months. Now, considering this is a small environment, a lot of the alerts were low. Alerts are usually classified as high, medium, and low, with high needing immediate attention. Now, I've escalated some alerts for this demonstration, selecting options and selecting SBA, you'll see medium alert that should raise an analyst curiosity. Hit escalate. Now I want to refresh. And this is the, the immediate alert that I'm talking about. So again, there are low alerts, but the medium hit draws my curiosity to investigate further. The alert lists a new user was added. This could be a legitimate alert. If this new user was added after normal working hours and had ev elevated privileges, meaning they, they elevated them to a administrative uh, access, this could be indi indicative of a compromised system. If that's the case, an extreme amount of damage could occur in your environment. Analysts would need to perform deeper analysis for this particular alert. Another feature contained in the SIM is the, the packet capture function, where you can obtain a PCAP file. Packets are a small segment of a, of a larger message. Data sent over the internet are divided into packets. These packets are then recombined by the receiving computer or device. Packet capture is intercepting that data for, for analysis purposes. Packets traversing through your network will provide crucial information in identifying what systems are communicating with each other or remote hosts. Clear indicator of compromise if remote host is deemed malicious. So let's power on Wireshark and review a PCAP file that I've captured earlier and observe what information an analyst can gather from that instance. I'm going to open up a previously captured PCAP file. Important items to view in Wireshark are your your timestamp, are your timestamp, which indicates the time that this uh, this traffic was being transmitted, your source which is the source IP address and the destination IP address. And you also want to look at the TCP. That's the protocol, transmission control protocol. So you can see that TCP was a protocol used between the source 192.168.200.135 to the destination 192.168.200.21. The analyst would need to perform more in-depth analysis to determine what is occurring. If this destination host identified as malicious, if this command and control host that is delivering commands to gain more access to pivot through the environment. These are but a few questions that should be raised when using these tools. And I'll do a quick deep dive into what I mean by the data that's being transmitted in this PCAP file. So I'll just go down here, follow, and do a TCP stream. And it's sending basically hello packets. This is very generic stuff. But that data could be, it could be real lengthy because it contains whatever data you're transmitting into it. But for instructional purposes, it's just transmitting hello. So I performed two different scenarios in the use of Security Onion and Wireshark. Identifying in Security Onion, the use of alerts to begin investigation on added user and communication between two systems in Wireshark. This is a very brief high-level overview of syslog analysis slash network forensics and tools that can be used to perform this endeavor. Most sims offer this functionality, but multiple tools are used to deep dive into what is considered malicious activity in your environment and doing further analysis on exactly what has occurred. And that concludes this demonstration and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, this concludes the case study portion of the webinar.
Uh, and we will finish up today by walking through a knowledge check, reviewing some of the core concepts and takeaways from the course. We'll cover four questions. When the question is read, please make a note of your answer, and after a few moments, we'll reveal the correct answer. So follow along and see how you do. Notable goals of cybersecurity include keeping out unauthorized users, creating a layered network defense, reducing open vulnerabilities, or all of the above. Okay, so you can go ahead and enter in the polling button. We have a lot of folks who already jumped right on all the above. In fact, everybody has. All right. People are still chiming in, piling on that, that all of the above option. And yes, that is correct. Those are three of the notable goals of cybersecurity as we discussed right up front in the presentation. Excellent. Moving on to our next question. So incidents occur constantly, but true or false, an event is a suspicious event with unwanted activity. Okay, so we'll allow some time to chime in. And again, to refresh your memory, this was the table that we had discussed, looking at authorized and unauthorized. So we have a lot of folks piling in on false. We have a Few, few folks are untrue. I think we've probably had most people chime in or are going to chime in at this point. And for this one, the answer is false. So this was just a tricky one. Um, events occur constantly, and an incident is a suspicious, a suspicious event with unwanted activity. Okay, next question. Which is not a benefit of incident analysis as part of an organization's cyber preparedness posture? Returning to normal operations, elimination of future attacks, improving defenses, or understanding your network? Okay, so we're looking again as which is not a benefit of incident analysis. So as you're thinking about cyber preparedness, and the various components of that. We have, um, right now, the majority are on B, but uh, we've got some folks chiming in on returning to normal operations. Okay, so I think we've had a lot of folks chiming in here. I think we have most everybody who will. We have understanding your network. So for this one, it's really the, the bold language of elimination of future attacks. Um, and while that would be great if it were guaranteed, um, that you can't completely eliminate future attacks um, as, as part of its analysis. It certainly helps to mitigate it, but that's what we're going for there with B. Excellent. And then our last question. This analysis uses a packet analyzer for network traffic monitoring and deep packet inspection for troubleshooting of network performance issues and network application issues, CDM, CHIRP, PCAP, or CyberTrace. Okay, we've got CHIRP and PCAP so far. There are only two, only two culprits for the correct answer. A lot of folks chiming in immediately on, on PCAP. And the correct answer here is PCAP. If you remember, CHIRP was from our previous webinar, which is um, um, a tool that DHS has introduced. But here we're looking at PCAP, which is that, that packet analyzer. Great. All right. So with that, we'll close out that pod and just go over a few high-level key takeaways here. Um, and again, that hammering the point home that an incident is, is an occurrence that actually or potentially jeopardizes the, this confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability, the three terms that we discussed, of an information system or the information the system processes, stores, or transmits, or that constitutes a violation of, or imminent threat of violation of security policies, procedures, or acceptable use. Again, that NIST definition. 
Incident analysis is the examination of the acquired data for its significance and probative value to the case, that acquired data being that, that um, investigated information, the forensics, if you will, that are derived from some of those indicators of compromise. And let's not forget that events occur constantly, but those incidents are those suspicious events with unwanted activities. Somewhat semantics, but it's important to consider when we're having conversations about incident analysis. So this concludes the, the webinar. Um, we hope you'd enjoyed the, uh, the webinar and come away with, with some knowledge that helps you better understand incident analysis. If you do want to learn more, we encourage you to visit the resources listed below. They include information out of CISA uh, and DHS, the National Cyber Incident Response Plan, uh, the, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Manual uh, Cyber Incident Handling Program, the National Institute for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies, their Cybersecurity Glossary, and, of course, the NIST. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Jake, to close us out. Great. Thanks, Joe. So lastly, we are interested in your feedback. Please complete this questionnaire as it will help us in the design of future training events in the Identify, Mitigate, Respond series of webinars. Thank you for your participation. A certificate of completion is available for download. Have a wonderful day.